I'm Ben Derman. I'm at the University of Chicago, assistant professor. I focus in plasma cell disorders. And uh, one of my main areas of research is in minimal or measurable residual disease, MRD, in myeloma. And, um, you know, one of the things that has become a big discussion now is is can MRD be used to guide decision making? For many years, we've just looked at MRD as a prognostic, um, as a prognostic sign. So MRD, of course, we're talking about low levels of myeloma cells in this case, below the limits of detection of standard conventional ways that our pathologists look at it. So, you know, traditionally we used to just look at the microscope, not we, but the pathologists would. They'd look for plasma cells. But, you know, you're only looking at hundreds to thousands of, plas- uh, of cells to look for a plasma cell. What MRD is doing is looking at millions, in some cases, millions of cells and trying to find as little as one myeloma cell. So we have a couple of different techniques that are extremely sensitive right now. One of them is called next-generation sequencing. The most obvious platform for that is Clonaseq. It's commercially available in the United States. And anyone anywhere can send this test as long as they're set up to do it. And if if you look at maybe about 2 million cells in the bone marrow, you can detect a single abnormal myeloma cell. You can call that MRD positive. Uh, And that has prognostic significance. If you're MRD negative at that 1 in a million mark, which we call 10 to the minus 6 negative, you have an extremely good prognosis compared to those who do not, who are MRD positive. And there's also next generation flow, sort of playing on that next generation term. Uh, This is using something called flow cytometry. It's a different technique looking at the molecules on the surface of myeloma cells. And what they're doing there is looking at somewhere around up to 10 million cells, so more cells. And if they detect, you know, a population of maybe 20 cells of myeloma cells, they can say this is positive. So with both of these techniques you can reach 10 to the minus 6 sensitivity. So the question is, first, is this prognostic? Does this portend better outcomes if you're MRD negative? There have been a number of trials, meta-analyses, trials on trials, that all show, yes, on a patient-to-patient basis, this is prognostic. Uh, The FDA actually uh, has reviewed this data. And even they technically agree that this is prognostic, and what they're more interested in is what is the difference in MRD negativity that will lead to a difference in outcomes in trials? What's the minimum difference? Is it a 10% difference in between two arms in order to conclude that, ah, we don't need to wait for progression-free survival. We don't need to wait for overall survival. We can make a call that this treatment is better than that treatment because you, you have a higher rate of MRD negativity. So that's all going on in the background. What I'm most interested in, and what patients are most interested in, in my opinion, is how is it going to influence decision-making right now for me in clinic? So that was the subject of what we discussed uh, this session at IMS, was really looking at MRD in clinical practice. And I think the more obvious situation to be looking at is, What can we do for patients who are consistently MRD negative over many occasions, let's say one or two years apart even, on consecutive occasions? Can we de-escalate treatment? Can we stop treatment even? So University of Chicago, we ran a trial called MRD to Stop, where we took patients with sustained MRD negativity at least uh, two occasions and had no evidence of disease by their PET scan, and we stopped treatment on those patients. And we found that 85% of patients were still alive without progression three years later. Almost 70% of patients were still MRD negative three years later. That is not in isolation. We now have data from the Greek group where they looked at about 50 patients as well. And they found the same thing. Patients who were MRD negative for three years in a row, so they had more stringent criteria, Um, had what's called a treatment-free survival of about 75% when they stopped lenalidomide, meaning 25% of patients had some kind of disease re-emergence, whether it was by MRD positivity or progression, within those first three years. And the Sloan-Kettering group is also doing a similar study and finding similar numbers. Uh, We also have data from the Spanish group, 
And what they did is they actually followed patients prospectively for two years on maintenance therapy with lenalidomide or in dexamethasone or with ixazomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. And patients who were MRD negative at 10 to the minus 6, they said, you're allowed to uh, discontinue therapy. And they found that over 80% of patients were still alive without progression four years later. So there's mounting evidence here, just to summarize that, that there's mounting evidence, in my opinion, that not only is it feasible to measure MRD, it's feasible to use MRD negativity to actually say, you might be eligible to stop your treatment. And I am already doing this now in my clinical practice for patients who are very much interested in stopping treatment, are worried about toxicities or having toxicities. This is an area where I feel like I'm ready to make a call to say, I think you can stop. But I think um, there is one large randomized phase three study that's ongoing that will help to answer this question too. Uh, It's called the SWOG S1803 or dramatic study. So patients get two years of lenalidomide or daratumumab and lenalidomide. And at the end of the two years, if you're MRD negative, they get randomized to stop everything or continue. And that will probably help to answer some of these questions. But by the time I think we have that answer, we will have moved on to doing different things. And so really what we wanted to do is try to provide some guidance to clinicians right now that it is okay to start having these conversations. What I want to stress about it is that you need to have a patient-centric conversation around this. It cannot be unilateral from the, from the physician to the patient. I think it's okay if it's unilateral from the patient to the physician to say, I'm ready to stop, but it can't be the other way. Because as a physician, I don't really want to own that decision entirely either. I want the patient to be in on, the, on this process too. If they're really hesitant about stopping, I don't think that it's necessarily the right thing then because progression can still happen and you want patients to feel okay about that. But when I ask patients, even who have progressed after stopping, was it worth it to be off of treatment for two or three years? The majority of them say yes. So that gives me at least some solace that I think we're doing the right thing. But you cannot do any of this unless you are able to measure MRD at 10 to the minus 6. I had people raise their hand in the room to see how many people had access to next-generation sequencing, how many people had access to next-generation flow, and it was not the majority of people in the room. For next-generation sequencing, one of the key things is you need to have what's called a clone ID, which is a baseline sample to allow for tracking over time. So, I had some patients who were initially on our, tried to be on our study for MRD to stop, but they'd lived too long. They were 15 years out and we couldn't find their bone marrow sample or they didn't have any material remaining. But nowadays we don't have that problem because we're sending a clone ID on every patient. And if you're a patient listening, what I would say is make sure to ask your doctor if you're getting newly diagnosed or you were just recently diagnosed to get this done. Because I think the information will be really important later on. It's hard to see how that's important right away, but it will be important later on. The trends are really important. Okay, so the other question that I get is, I never got to MRD negativity, or I was MRD negative, I lost it. I'm now MRD positive. What do I do? This is the trickiest part and very controversial, and I don't think I have an answer for this. In my clinical practice right now, I generally tell these patients to continue with what they're on, but... There are some circumstances where a loss of MRD negativity is concerning to me that a patient may develop a frank progression soon. And now we have treatments like Siltacel, CAR-T therapy, that take time to produce. So that might be an ideal opportunity to say, why don't we collect you now? We have the time. We're not in a rush. This could be a good opportunity. It's something worth discussing with your doctor. What about people who never get to MRD negativity? We know that some of those patients have what's called an MGUS-like state. They sort of revert back to a precursor state almost. They're not progressing. They have a very low risk of progression. But these are not patients that I'm comfortable stopping therapy because what I don't know is what happens when we do that. And and that scares me a little bit. But as far as the other side of the coin, do we escalate therapy? Should we give these patients something else now to convert them to MRD negativity. And I think this is a ripe question for research. I would encourage patients not to jump the gun on that just yet. Uh, 
And I, I think I'd be hypocritical if I was saying that we should be treating all of those patients. Um, but I do feel like this is a question that we're going to continue to have is, you know, if you've had your, your standard uh, state-of-the-art therapy and you're still not MRD negative, you may be a patient that is appropriate for some escalation of therapy. Well, we have to weigh increasing toxicity with potential increase in efficacy because we're taking asymptomatic patients and we're giving them something that could end up making their life worse in some cases. So, again, a, a question that I think we still need more information on. Uh, interestingly, not just in our experience, so in MRD to stop, patients who we did not restart therapy until they met criteria for progression. So just because they became MRD positive did not mean that we jumped to then starting treatment. Other studies, like the Greek experience and the MSK Sloan Kettering experience, they usually restarted treatment on MRD resurgence. One of the reasons I like what we did is we got to see the natural history of it. I actually had some patients who went back into MRD negativity after a small bump in in MRD. Maybe their immune system kicked in. But for most patients, MRD resurgence was followed then by progression at some point. And we were able to restart patients, in many cases, on lenalidomide-containing therapies again. Oftentimes, it was quadruplet therapy. And we were able to get them to MRD negative at 10 to the minus 6 again. Now, am I going to be uh, as, uh, you know, um, enthusiastic about stopping in those patients? No. I think they've proven that's probably not the right thing. But, you know, there's other diseases, other hematologic malignancies like CML, for instance, where there is a treatment-free interval that's built in, and restarting therapy actually works just as well in the majority of those patients. So I think patients can be reassured that in almost all cases, you can get back to MRD negativity. And so I think that's really encouraging. 